The Nintendo 64 is one of the most legendary and revolutionary game consoles in history due to its atypical controller, the choice to stay on the cartridge format when everyone else has chosen the CD support, because of the exceptional games that came out on the console, and because of its unusual history. Today we go back to the epic story of the Nintendo 64, a console that has marked history so much that all the innovations it brought are still used today, but which, despite these revolutions, was not able to outsell the competition due to a series of twists that we are going to talk about today. Here is the uncanny story of the Nintendo 64, one of the most revolutionary consoles of all time. We are at the beginning of the 90s, in the middle of the Nintendo vs. Sega War, which is wreaking havoc all over the world. Sega manages to compete with Nintendo with its Mega Drive Genesis, even if Nintendo is catching up after the two years lead of Sega. The two manufacturers are now neck and neck. The war is intense. The two manufacturers are releasing great games one after another alongside huge promotional campaigns to try to take the advantage. And it is in this context that Ken Kutaragi, an executive at Sony, approaches Nintendo again by offering to develop a peripheral for the Super Nintendo that could read CDs, a competitor to Sega's Mega CD, but cheaper and better technically. Nintendo hesitates. On the one hand, Ken Kutaragi and Sony provided an excellent sound chip for the console, and it's a technical argument which puts the Super Nintendo above the Mega Drive Genesis for a lot of people. But on the other hand, the Sega Mega CD doesn't sell well, and Nintendo doesn't really need this expansion thanks to their technology. They can upgrade the cartridges using additional chips like the Super FX, which already allows Nintendo to do some kind of 3D on a 16-bit console. In order to convince Nintendo, Ken Kutaragi and his team met with Nintendo executives to demonstrate the advantages of CD support. Ken Kutaragi maintains that they can store 100 times more data than cartridges, that they are 10 times cheaper to produce, and that they can be produced more quickly. Barely a few days for 10,000 CDs, whereas it takes several months for the cartridges. CDs also allow for high-quality sound, and remember, for Nintendo, sound quality is extremely important. Even the Game Boy, which is just a cheap, portable 8-bit console, has enough to output stereo sound. But during the demonstration, a big defect will really jump out at Nintendo. The loading times of the CDs are way too slow. Ken Kutaragi remembers, The CDs took about 30 seconds to start the demos, and then there are loading times between each demo, and meanwhile, I heard the Nintendo executives talking among themselves and exclaiming, Who is going to wait that long every time we have data to load? It's not good at all. At that time, I thought Nintendo was going to refuse. However, they ended up accepting. At first, Nintendo accepts the partnership with Sony because it will make it possible to create all new types of more scripted games like they already saw with PC Engine TurboGrafx-16 earlier, but above all, because they are afraid that Sony will work with other manufacturers, including Sega, Sony is a much bigger company than Nintendo, and they have a huge research and development laboratory. It could be dangerous to let them go elsewhere. But Sony will try to circumvent the contract so as to not have to share the potential profits with Nintendo. Instead of developing a simple extension for the Super Nintendo, they will develop their own console compatible with Nintendo cartridges, and will also create a whole new type of CD called the Super Disc, which obviously is not included in the contract signed with Nintendo, and therefore leaves all the money from licensing the games to go into Sony's pocket. Remember that Nintendo doesn't make money by selling consoles, they make money by selling games and licensing games. Sony is a threat to their business. Sony presents its console at the Consumer Electronics Show in 1991, explaining their partnership with Nintendo. But when Nintendo learns about this, they are enraged and scared about Sony. They will meet with Philips in disaster to replace Sony for the CD expansion and make a new deal. During that Consumer Electronics Show, after Sony announced to everyone they will work with Nintendo, Howard Lincoln comes on stage and reveals to the amazement of journalists that Nintendo is abandoning Sony and they are now working with Philips. This is a huge shock for everyone. It's a shame for Sony taken by surprise and overwhelmed by events. We will talk in more detail about the suit on Sony's side, but on Nintendo's side, they don't really know what to do with this new add-on that Philips has to develop. On the one hand, they see Sega's Mega CD, which does not sell well, 
and which also tarnishes the image of the console, which some journalists describe as a kit console. But above all, they cannot add chips, as they already do in the cartridges, to boost the capabilities of the machine. In addition to that, piracy is menacing, since the NES and the Super NES were protected by a key and lock system with two identical chips, one on the console, one on the cartridge, which communicates together, something impossible to do on CD. And also, Nintendo doesn't know the CD format. They don't know how games are developed on the CD format, which necessarily requires an adjustment period. But they don't have the time or the manpower to adapt. Sega hits hard, and they have to continue releasing games to regain the upper hand. But more than anything, Nintendo still has Sony's CD presentation in mind with the endless loading times, and they can't even imagine a Mario game with that much loading time. For all these reasons, Nintendo decides to cancel the CD player produced by Philips, which will still leave the Dutch company the right to use Nintendo characters on their console, the Philips CDI, games that have become sadly famous for their mediocrity. But at the same time, Sony, after another failed partnership with Sega, announces that they are going to develop their own console. It will be a 32-bit console, scheduled for the end of 1994 in Japan, and the console will use CD media. And then begins a huge propaganda from Sony on the CD medium and all its advantages by highlighting the hundreds of megabits available on this medium and the cheaper price. The 3DO company also announces its console, the 3DO, which will also use the CD format scheduled for the end of 1993. Sega also announces that they have started the development of their next console. Philips tries to exist by advertising the Philips CDI everywhere, the video game market is racing, and suddenly, the Super NES and the Mega Drive seem to be coming to the end of their life when they have only been there for a few years. On August 24, 1993, alongside the Shoshinkai, a trade show organized annually by Nintendo, the CEO of Nintendo, Hiroshi Yamuchi, announces in front of the crowd a partnership with Silicon Graphics to jointly develop a console whose marketing price will be under $250. It will be released first in arcades in 1994, then in consoles in 1995, and it will be a 64-bit machine under the codename Project Reality, supported by a video demonstration. Wow, that's a great shock for everyone. A 64-bit console? But we are still in the 16-bit console era, and Sega and Sony have announced that their next console will be a 32-bit, and Nintendo intends to do twice as well. Nintendo also talks about pixel-perfect conversion from arcade to console. At the time, arcades were driving technical innovations that were then integrated into consoles, and the arcade at home was a slogan that we had been hearing since the beginning of the 80s, but it was rarely good conversions. I will talk about all this in much more detail on the video concerning the Neo Geo. And then, in addition to that, Silicon Graphics is a company extremely renowned for its workstations and its very great expertise in everything related to three-dimensional objects. The journalists of the time point out that it is on these same machines that were made Jurassic Park, which has just been released. According to Tom Kalinske, CEO of Sega of America, Silicon Graphics had contacted Sega first to work with them, but Sega Japan refused the partnership information that can be questioned because it has never been confirmed and Silicon Graphics had already contacted Nintendo at the beginning of the 90s. And then as often with Nintendo after the announcement, the console completely disappears for a little while and returns on May 5, 1994. Nintendo announces that the Project Reality console will not use CD format, it will remain on cartridges. To justify its choice, Nintendo explains that despite its undeniable qualities, the CD format brings too many defects, the loading times are way too slow, and they will handicap the production of games. The CD players are not yet developed, and Nintendo cannot guarantee the same solidity between the lenses and the cartridge port. The CDs are also too fragile in their eyes compared to cartridges, the CD player will increase the price of the console moreover, and they will no longer be able to technically upgrade their console in putting chips in the cartridges which is what they did on the NES with the multi-memory controller, which took it to another dimension, and on the Super Nintendo with the Super FX or the DSPs, which enabled games like Mario Kart to see the light of day. Before once again repeating that the loading times are unacceptable in their eyes, many believe that this choice is also due to the fear of piracy, but remember, 
It's mid-94 and Nintendo already has this piracy problem with disc copiers and counterfeiters swarming the Super NES. And on top of that, it is possible to protect the data of a CD. The CD does not necessarily mean piracy, even if it is what one would think since the PlayStation was very badly secured. I would imagine that even if it has been taken into consideration by Nintendo, it is not the reason which pushed Nintendo to refuse this new format. Some people think Nintendo stuck to cartridges to keep licensing, but licensing also exists with CDs. But this announcement is having a hard time getting over to journalists who are extremely disappointed with Nintendo's choice, which they will describe as an aging society unable to evolve with its time. The developers themselves are even more disgusted than the others. They will still have to make a lot of optimization and compression efforts, very difficult and time-consuming tasks when developing a game and even more in 3D. And after all, as Sony says with its propaganda with the CD, the CD support is less expensive and it makes it possible to transport more data than cartridges. A few months later, the console changes its name and becomes the Ultra 64, with the specs starting to leak and few 3D character images too. At the end of 1994, Sony and Sega released their console in Japan, which got off to a great start. Again, Nintendo is late, even though they proudly announced that the Ultra 64 will make these 32-bit consoles obsolete. It's not going to stop them from selling well. In order to continue to exist in the face of the release of the new consoles, the Ultra 64 changes its name again. Now the Nintendo Ultra 64, and Nintendo announces it will be available in 1995 in Japan and the United States. But unfortunately, nothing will go as planned. During 1995, Nintendo is in a difficult position because the Sony PlayStation 1 and the Sega Saturn attract a lot of Japanese players who are totally fascinated by the arrival of this new third dimension, which is fascinating. For the first time, to a lot of players, they can move on the three axes. Inevitably, it generates a lot of interest. Fortunately for Nintendo, the launch of the PlayStation is marked by major technical issues. The first CD players have major problems reading data with CDs that are not detected, or they will completely damage the game CDs, and Sony will have great difficulty in correcting the problem. For more than a year, a large part of the PlayStations that leave the factory have some issues. As much on the Sega side as on the Sony side, the games of the beginning of 3D are not very good. Gameplay problems due to unsuitable controllers, a lot of camera problems, technical problems with a lot of bugs and glitches. Apart from a few notable exceptions, most of the games that come out are really bad and based only on the curiosity of players for this third dimension. Which means that throughout the year, 95 sales do not take off as expected, and Sega still leads the dance in Japan. And surprisingly, it's the Super Nintendo that will get the best out of it with big releases like Yoshi's Island, Chrono Trigger, Dragon Quest VI, Donkey Kong Country 1 and 2, and Killer Instinct. Nintendo, thanks to the lack of big games from competing consoles, managed to stop the bleeding well assisted by competitors who are stepping on each other's toes. Virtua Fighter and Virtua Racing at Sega and Tekken and Ridge Racer at Sony are the same types of games. And Nintendo will take the opportunity to announce that many third-party publishers are working on the Ultra 64, and among them big names like Paradigm Simulation, Spectrum Holobyte, Acclaim, Virgin Interactive, Mindscape, LucasArts, Midway, Rare, Electronic Arts, and even Squaresoft. This group of studios is called the Dream Team, and Nintendo seems to have succeeded in uniting large studios behind its console, despite the latter being disappointed with the cartridge format. And with that, they announce that they have finished designing the console and sharing the technical characteristics of the machine, and they are extremely impressive. And then comes the month of May, and with it the very first E3 in the history of video games. Sega takes the floor first and announces the surprise release of the Sega Saturn at $399, which will alienate the entire video game world. Nobody is ready to buy a console that expensive. Outside of Japan, nobody really knows the Sega Saturn. Resellers are not ready, and third-party developers did not develop any games for the launch of the console. And then comes the Sony keynote, built around the history of Sony, its presentation, its arrival in the world of video games, and a big presentation of the new PlayStation brand. And then comes the turn of Steve Race, 
the president of Sony Computer Entertainment of America, who will have this legendary sentence. While he had a speech written, and after seeing the mixed reactions from reporters to the announcement of the price of the Saturn, he replaced it by announcing only the price of the console, $100 cheaper than the Sega Saturn under the euphoria of journalists. A slap. And history to kill even more Sega, Michael Jackson makes an appearance on the side of Sony, who before was linked to Sega. And then comes the presentation of Howard Lincoln in front of the journalists, and it's not great. A big part of it presents the counterfeits of the Super Nintendo games and even comes to confirm how widespread they are, since they sell more counterfeit games than Sega games. And while everyone was finally expecting a demonstration of the Ultra 64, a few games, the controller and finally having a release date, Nintendo announces once again that the release of the console has been postponed and that it will be released in April 1996 in Japan, without giving new dates for the United States or Europe. Everyone is upset. It's been more than a year of waiting while the PlayStation and the Saturn are coming, and no one understands. Nintendo just announced they finished designing the console, so why delay its release? Well, as Howard Lincoln tries to explain, the console is ready, but the games are not. Nintendo and the publishers have a lot of trouble developing games on the Ultra 64 for three reasons. Firstly, the architecture of the console is very complex and hard to grasp especially for developers accustomed to the NES and the Super NES. Secondly, the development kits were designed by Silicon Graphics, so everything is in English. But the Japanese developers were not used to English at that time, so it took a long time to adapt whether it was for Nintendo or for other Japanese studios. And the third reason is the arrival of 3D. Adding the third dimension also adds a lot of design problems and a lot of freedom. It's not a transition that can be done overnight, evidenced by the really bad games that came out by the dozen on PlayStation at that time. And the next day at the show, Nintendo, aware that Sony is taking the lead and that they won the hearts of journalists, Nintendo shows the Ultra 64 for the first time. It contrasts completely with its previous consoles. First, the console is black, very sober, but above all, it has four parts for the controllers, which means that it offers four players to play simultaneously something very rare on previous consoles, where you had to bring a fairly expensive accessory and only a few games were compatible. But there is nothing to do. Sony is taking over. Journalists are only talking about PlayStation. Sony is bringing back stars like Michael Jackson to praise the merits of their console, backed with an exceptional promotional campaign, especially with the traditional press. And for weeks, everyone only talks about this war between Sony and Sega, which has just started, and the few pages that mention Nintendo dwell briefly on the Virtual Boy, which has been released in Japan and the US, but which Nintendo didn't even highlight. And little by little, Sony is gaining momentum by announcing the dozens of studios that will work on the PlayStation, with big names like Namco, Ubisoft, Konami, or even Psygnosis that they have bought. The PlayStation is attracting attention, and Sony is planning 12 games for the North American launch of its console, which promises to be grandiose. In order to fight back, Nintendo sends some information here and there, and makes a big promotional campaign to tell players not to buy a 32-bit console, that the console they are preparing is superior in every way, and that it will show up a few months later. And then the PlayStation comes out in the US, and it's off to a great start, even though the CD player issues aren't fully fixed, although Sony has changed the materials around the lens. In just a few weeks, the PlayStation catches up with the Saturn, which was released six months earlier, and is shaping up to be Nintendo's most serious competitor. And Nintendo knew this very well. In the interviews before its release, Howard Lincoln, for example, underlined the economic power of Sony far above Nintendo and Sega, but had doubts about its ability to produce good games. And indeed, the games at the launch of the console produced by Sony are not very good, or even not good at all. But that does not prevent the console from selling, thanks to an excellent marketing campaign from Sony and an affordable price tag. And on October 20th, 1995, images of the prototype of Final Fantasy VII on the Ultra 64 are sent to journalists around the world, and wow, what a slap. We are very far from Final Fantasy VI, 
The graphical evolution is surprising, and maybe the Nintendo 64 is as powerful as Nintendo says. With these images, Nintendo sends an invitation to the Shoshinkai, which is held next month and promises to present the console at that time. And the image of this invitation shows the controller of the console, which seems to embed a joystick. The appointment is made. The Shoshinkai promises to be memorable. November 22, 1995, the Shoshinkai is finally here. And it's an amazing show, lots of new games being shown. Kirby Bowl 64, a Kirby game in a 3D environment, a tech demo of a Zelda game with fights in 3D, a new Mario Kart game called Super Mario Kart R, which shows real-time 3D Mario Kart, up to four players at the same time. A huge shock that no one expected, and Nintendo shows what no one else can do. Only the Nintendo 64 offers four-player games without accessories. Then comes Pilot Wing 64, an ultra-realistic flight simulation that is light years away from what the competition does. And it does not stop. Right after it's Wave Ray 64, which comes to show the abilities of the console to manage water, something very complex to program in a game in addition to being a good game in itself. And then it's Star Fox 64, which shows the enormous progress that has been made with the previous one. GoldenEye also makes a very remarkable appearance. Everything seems to be going well for Nintendo. Then the images of the next Final Fantasy are shown like the next Zelda, and the game is planned on the newly announced console add-on, which will be using magnetic disks that allow more data to be stored than cartridges without having the disadvantages of long loading times. Hiroshi Yamuchi also announces that Dragon Quest VII is in progress and that it will use magnetic disks. Third-party publisher games are also shown with games such as Blastozer, Body Harvest, or Star Wars but we are still far from all the third-party publishers announced by Nintendo earlier. Beyond the games, the console is also shown with yet another name change. The Nintendo 64 will be its final name, as well as a new logo, and above all, its gamepad. The controller is presented and highlighted by the hostesses who invite people to try it, and it's a huge revolution. It's a three-branch controller that embeds an analog joystick in the center, a big novelty that will allow to easily and naturally control the characters in a three-dimensional universe. And yes, because neither the Saturn nor the PlayStation have a controller with an analog joystick, they just followed previous gamepad. But in the meantime, Nintendo has already moved forward. And it will be such a huge revolution that it will be immediately copied during the Shoshinkai. Employees of the Sonic team are present and will take a look at the show, and they will be so captivated by this novelty, well brought by a new game, that they are going to decide to make their own joystick for their next game, which will be Nights into Dreams, which they half confessed during an interview for an issue of the magazine Retro Gamer. But what no one has been able to copy is the notches on the joystick, which make 3D movement more natural. Nobody has been able to copy this because Nintendo patented the innovation. These notches seem trivial, but add a layer of simplicity and ergonomics. Remember, it's the beginning of 3D, and it's really hard to integrate this huge novelty while letting the player take it in hand simply. These notches will remain in Nintendo controllers for a very long time since they will be used on GameCube and the Wii. But it doesn't stop there, because in addition to this joystick, Nintendo had the excellent idea of adding buttons that will be used to manipulate the camera. The big concern of these three-dimensional games, since the camera is hard to program and must try to follow the player without necessarily knowing where he wants to go. But the other big revolution that this controller will bring is that this gamepad will adapt itself to games and not the other way around. Thanks to its three branches, it can be adapted to three different styles of controls. The most classic, and the one that will be used the most, is to have one hand on the joystick and the other on the right buttons, which will allow you to control a character in a three-dimensional universe. The second is to use the D-pad and the buttons, which is useful in 2D games and resembles the controls of the Super NES. And the third is to use the D-pad and the joystick, which is very useful for FPS, for example, where you can control a character. Aim at the same time, emphasized by the button on the back of the controller, the Z button to shoot, a button which has a different feedback, a slight pinch great for shooting games or for making key combinations. And this controller is so revolutionary that all these new features are still used today in current controllers, and it will help gamers adapt to this new 3D dimension. But beyond all that, what will take Nintendo into a new era is above all the presentation of a beta version of Super Mario 64. 
And not just the presentation. The game is playable at the show and everyone wants to try it. Super Mario 64 is a huge bombshell and a big revolution. Mario's movements are very natural thanks to the controller and his joystick. There are interactions with the scenery everywhere, the camera management and all these different types of gameplays, whether it's running, diving, swimming underwater, sliding down slides, clinging to ledges, climbing trees, launching yourself with a cannon, it's amazing what Mario can do. And the biggest shock is perhaps graphical, and that's what we see the most in the magazines of this time. This new Mario, it looks exceptional and so revolutionary compared to what has been done before and this which comes out on other consoles. It's such a huge slap in the face that all the journalists are already considering it to be the best game in the world, even though it's not even out yet, and it's only 50% completed according to Miyamoto. Can you imagine how crazy and never seen before? The impact of the game is huge, all the magazines talk about it, and it manages to stop time all by itself. After journalists relayed his presentation, the video game world stops spinning. Sales of other consoles slow down. Everyone is waiting for Super Mario 64 and Nintendo 64. Nintendo has pulled off a masterstroke. Temporize as much as possible while waiting for the console whose release promises to be exceptional. At the beginning of 1996, while Nintendo has succeeded in slowing interest in other consoles, an incident will change everything. Sony, concerned about the sales of its console, which does not take off as much as planned, will move up a gear. They're going to start canvassing new studios to develop only for PlayStation, and they're going to go bigger. They hear about a dispute between Nintendo and Squaresoft, which is developing Super Mario RPG. While the game is almost finished, Nintendo is not yet completely satisfied with the game and will ask Squaresoft to make some additional changes, changes that will delay the translation and the release of the game, something that does not help Squaresoft at all, which has other projects planned on the new consoles. Following these changes, a small dispute will break out between the two companies. When Nintendo hears about this dispute, they see that as an incredible opportunity. They will meet Squaresoft and offer them to become a privileged partner for the PlayStation and, in return, Sony will publish their biggest games outside of Japan. A golden opportunity for Squaresoft. Editing a game is really expensive, especially for RPGs, where you have to translate all the text into lots of different languages, and they are struggling marketing games in countries extremely different from Japan. Squaresoft, who also wants to work with CDs way more than cartridges, will therefore accept and will announce at the beginning of the year that they will only develop games for the Sony PlayStation, claiming that they are abandoning Nintendo because of the cartridge support of the console. Cartridge support which has been announced two years earlier. A big stab in the back for Nintendo. While they had always highlighted Squaresoft games, and remember that even images of a next Final Fantasy were shown at the Shoshinkai. Furthermore, Squaresoft serves as a true example in the Japanese video game industry. They are admired by other development companies, and other studios will then make the same choice. Turn to the PlayStation, a disaster for Nintendo. And to top it off, Nintendo announces yet another delay for the console of several weeks in Japan and later in North America. All the momentum is dead, and Sony is going to take the opportunity to bludgeon the people of promo campaigns for his console, but strangely, it's not working as intended. Super Mario 64 and the presentation of the Shoshinkai is still in everyone's head. He manages to retain everyone, and Nintendo sends images and information to magazines every month. But it won't last forever. On March 22, 1996, Resident Evil releases on the PlayStation, and it's a great hit, and brings the PlayStation sales back, which begins to pick up little by little. Fortunately, the E3 1996 is here. It is important not to let go of the pressure for Nintendo, but Nintendo is not only. Sega is presenting Nights into Dreams, produced by the Sonic team, which offers an unprecedented gaming experience with its joystick too, and introduces a new Sonic game, Sonic Extreme, which draws attention and above all, Sony is already announcing a price drop for its console. It's crazy, it has just been released, and they are already managing to drop its price to $199. $100 less than its old price, just when the Sega Saturn drops its price to $299 to be the same as the PlayStation. 
Sony is still using its excessive power to hit where it hurts, in addition to presenting lots of big games coming out at the end of the year. In fact, Sony is doing what Sega did a few years ago, sell the console at loss and try to recover the money from these losses on the games. But Sony is so rich that they can afford to sell the PlayStation much cheaper than it costs to produce, and now they are forcing Sega to lower the price of its console again and to go into even more debt to be competitive. But again, Nintendo, in addition to presenting a few games, focuses its presentation around Super Mario 64, and once again, successfully. It's incredible. Once again, Super Mario 64 steals the show and puts Nintendo back in the spotlight just at the right time. And with that, Nintendo finally announces a release date for Japan and North America. It will finally be June for Japan and September for North America, and a few months later in Europe. And on top of that, Nintendo is going to match Sony's new price. The Nintendo 64 is also to cost $200. 200 for a 64-bit console that's pretty impressive, but they can afford it since the console doesn't have a CD player, and this is what is the most expensive thing on competing consoles. Still a little while to wait, just enough time for Sony to enlist new studios behind its console. But for the umpteenth time, the console is delayed for a week in Japan to give Nintendo the time to polish up Super Mario 64, which was already the cause of his delay twice. After a great marketing campaign, the console finally arrives in Japan on June 23, 1996, and this is madness. The Nintendo 64 is out of stock the first hours. There's long lines in front of all the stores that sell it. Nevertheless, it only comes out with three games, Super Mario 64, Pilot Wing 64, and a game of Shogai. What's going on? Where have all the games announced by Nintendo gone? Where have the third-party publishers and the so-called Dream Team gone? This time, the message is crystal clear. Nintendo will only be able to count on itself. Third-party publishers are all sucked in by Sony, and it's more flexible and advantageous partnership policy. Fortunately, Super Mario 64 carries the console on its own. It sells the same number of units as the Nintendo 64, even though they are not even sold together. It's amazing. And even better, it sells more than the console. As it is out of stock, players bought the game while waiting for the console to come back in stock. It's the revolution that everyone was waiting for, and the expectations were justified. It's a huge slap in this era of the beginning of 3D where really bad games follow one after another because developers do not know how to use the third dimension. Nintendo comes to give a lesson of what a three-dimensional game is with an excellent camera which always places itself behind Mario gradually to show the player what is behind him, with some places in the game where the camera is locked, with dozens of movements for Mario that will allow him to face new situations, bosses of all kinds to fight that will allow the player to use every Mario's movement, lots of different environments to visit, which brings new gameplay mechanics, like the lava, which makes Mario jump, the flames which make him run without stopping, or a shipwrecked galleon at the bottom of the water which contains a treasure, forcing Mario to dive and manage his oxygen. Full of super worked animations like Mario suffocating in the poison maze, slowly sinking in the sand, or even falling asleep if you don't do anything for too long. With new power-ups which push the concept even further, the wing cap which allows you to survey the skies freely, it's amazing the feeling of freedom that comes out of it. The metal cap which makes Mario invincible, 
allows you to walk at the bottom of the water and withstand the current and the vanish cap, which allows Mario to pass through walls and fences. Super Mario 64 is an earthquake which will completely upset the world of video games and will give developers the understanding of what makes a good game in 3D, highlighting great freedom and consistently renewing the gameplay, punctuated by an exceptional and very original level design full of excellent ideas such as the start of the game, which takes place in front of the castle with a little ambient music that lets the players free to experiment and take control of Mario's movements without any danger. It's one of the most ahead game of its time, and a game that will bring a big revolution and a structure that will be copied by hundreds of games, and which still serves as a basis to 3D platformers even to this day. And you just have to read the magazines of the time to understand the crazy impact of the game. For Player One, it's a rare pearl and a gem. For Superpower, Super Mario 64 has an unprecedented richness and is a playful masterpiece. For Game Pro, the game has a similar impact as Super Mario Bros. 1 on NES. It is revolutionary, fascinating, and incredibly fun. And Crash, Knights, and Sonic can all go back to sleep. For X64, nothing will ever be the same when you've played Super Mario 64. For Edge, it's the most fabulous game, and the video game world just changed forever. For the magazine Maximum, it's the best game in recent years and a game that everyone should try. For computer and video games, it's probably the best gaming experience ever. And Next Generation also titles outright that it's the best game ever, and I could go on and on quoting dozens of others. It's amazing how it is unanimous and how everyone speaks of it as a real revolution. And all that fits on 8 megabits. It's <laughs> incredible. And now we understand more why Nintendo chose the cartridge format. No loading time, we can go from one level to another in a few seconds. The levels are gigantic with loading points between certain parts that we do not notice thanks to the cartridge format. And there is a lot of sub-level without loading times. And Nintendo has never been a big fan of excessive cutscenes anyway. But as Miyamoto said in the magazine Edge the year before, if the Nintendo 64 doesn't come out with five or six games, players will buy the other consoles and that's exactly what will happen. As excellent as Super Mario 64 is, and as revolutionary as it is, three games for the launch of a console, it's ridiculous. Especially after all these announcements and the so-called Dream Team, and little by little the Japanese public will be heading towards the PlayStation 1, which, even if it has less impressive games, has more games to offer. In fact, the release of the Nintendo 64 will make everyone understand that, on the one hand, there is Nintendo alone on its console, and on the other one, Sony has taken over all the third-party publishers on its side. And it will even be worse for the US release in September 96, which is going to come out with only two games, but which on the surface will also be a great launch since all the units produced have been sold and the console will be out of stock for a little while, but which will be the trigger for players to become aware. Now that Nintendo has arrived, everyone understands that a new generation of consoles is here. The Nintendo 64 release unintentionally boosted PlayStation sales. But since Miyamoto was aware of that, why did Nintendo only release three games with the console? Well, the development of games on the console is really complex and takes longer than expected. The Virtual Boy had mobilized staff. The Game Boy, for its part, also requires a little attention since a redesign is in progress, and suddenly Nintendo was a little overwhelmed and they finally decided to release the console with five games at the launch, the three that came out with Star Fox 64 and Mario Kart 64. But the development of Star Fox 64 is too late, so they decided to put it aside to focus on Mario Kart 64 and make sure it releases on time, but at the end of the year, 95, the computer which contains the 3D models of the characters breaks down, and the hard disk data is corrupted, which forced the team to push back the exits of the game to redo them. Suddenly, the sales of the Nintendo 64 decrease very quickly after its release, and the end of the year of 96 is also when the first wave of good games on the PlayStation comes out with Tomb Raider, Wipeout, Crash Bandicoot, or Twisted Metal 2. The PlayStation finally begins to show 3D games that correctly use this new dimension, other than racing games or fighting games. Nintendo is once again in a delicate position, and Despite some good games from third-party publishers such as International Superstar Soccer 64, the ancestor of Pro Evolution Soccer, which is the first football game to use motion capture for player movements, and therefore 
allows itself the luxury of adding hundreds of movements never seen before. But it's going to be one of the only clearings of the dark sky of the Nintendo 64. But despite a difficult year in the end and a late release, the results are not too bad for the Nintendo 64, which in a few months is gaining grounds on the PlayStation and the Saturn. And at the end of November, the 1996 Shoshinkai is here. The show takes place at a crucial time. We are the pinnacle of this confrontation between the three manufacturers. Nintendo must do something big to continue to gain ground. The star of the show is the bulky drive, now called the 64DD, for Nintendo 64 disk drive, an accessory that plugs into the EXT port below the console and uses magnetic disks. The big advantage of these magnetic disks is that they can store more data than cartridges, about 64 megabytes against 16 for cartridges at that time, and above all, the loading times are much faster than CDs. A compromise between the two, even if it's far away from the hundreds of megabits used by the PlayStation games thanks to the CD media. But another advantage of magnetic disks is that it's possible to rewrite the data on the magnetic disks, which makes it possible to modify the data in-game as shown in the demonstration of Mario Artist. Nintendo had also planned to make stations where you could insert magnetic disks and for 200 yen, or $150, have additional content in the games. Yes, it's the equivalent of DLC, but at a really low price. And in addition to all of that, the 64DD also allows you to connect online and even download updates for games or free games from time to time. And the games will cost less to produce and sell than cartridge games. This presentation is convincing, and Nintendo seems to have what it takes to keep coming back to the PlayStation and the Saturn. Especially since Nintendo ends up announcing that the 64DD will be released in Japan in the year 97, and that it will be released with Zelda 64 as a launch game. A few short excerpts of the game are presented at the show, which will cause great expectation. And it's not the only thing that is presented at the Shoshinkai. Some games are also available for demonstration, such as Mario Kart 64, Yoshi's Island 64, Earthbound 64, or Star Fox 64. Finally, it is clear that the year 1997 will be the most critical year and the turning point of this war between these three giants. While the word is spreading concerning the 64DD, the year 1996 ends on a very good note for Nintendo thanks to Mario Kart 64, which released in Japan and which makes sales of the console take off again like a rocket in Japan. But at the beginning of 1997, Enix, publisher of the ultra-popular Dragon Quest saga in Japan, announced that they were abandoning Nintendo to develop on Sony's PlayStation. Once again, Sony is hitting where it hurts, and just when Nintendo was coming back strong and full of promise. And then a few days later, it's Final Fantasy VII which comes out in Japan, and a few months later in the rest of the world, and it's an exceptional tsunami. It sells at a phenomenal speed and makes the sales of the PlayStation explode, well accompanied by Castlevania Symphony of the Night and dozens of other games coming out every month. The Nintendo 64 lacks support from third-party publishers, and when Nintendo games do not come out, no one buys the console, and even some rare gems from third-party publishers will cause problems, such as Duke Nukem, who has been censored from all part of its Nintendo 64 version. And that's where everyone is going to realize that Sony is turning it upside down on everyone by doing exactly what they said they would never do, by implementing an aggressive royalty system like Nintendo and Sega did, but third-party publishers are a bit trapped. They have already made the switch to the PlayStation and are already preparing games on CD. Meanwhile, the Sega Saturn is drowning. They don't really have a choice and are somewhat forced to continue with Sony. But where Nintendo had a universal royalty system, they almost never made exceptions and the rule were the same for everyone. Sony will negotiate with the biggest publishers to be sure to keep them on its console and put the others up against the wall. And on April 25, 1997, Sony will also be inspired by Nintendo's novelties and release a new controller, the Dual Analog Controller, which adds two analog joysticks in the lower part of the controller. Some journalists complain about it being not very ergonomic, given that these joysticks are far from the thumbs and forces you to hold the controller lower on the two branches, but Sony has no choice. 
They can't completely change controllers given that it must be backward compatible with games already released, and then you get used to it. But the biggest concern is the shape of the joysticks, which is hollow at the end, and therefore are not very pleasant to use. But just a few days later, Nintendo released Star Fox 64, an exceptional game that showed off the machine's impressive capabilities and used the controller extremely well. And above all, it is sold with an accessory, the Rumble Pack, which allows you to add a vibration system to the controller, something never seen before. Having physical feedback on what is happening in-game improves immersion. Once again, Nintendo is innovating, and they have already made Sony's new controller obsolete a few days after its release. But the most important thing is that the Nintendo 64 finally lands in Europe at the beginning of 1997, but with six games this time. It is very poor for a release one year after the start of the console's life in Japan. The launch is terrible because Sony has taken a very important place in Europe by investing monstrous amounts of money, for example. At the time, the United Kingdom was considered a very promising market, so for the release of its console, Nintendo launched a promotional campaign of £2 million, Sega had launched a promotional campaign of £4 million, and Sony launched a promotional campaign of £20 million. It's impossible to fight against a marketing power that huge. Sony is everywhere, and it's not wasted money because Sony does very good marketing campaigns. In addition to being released one year before the Nintendo 64 lands in these countries, and to have a much larger library of games. And on top of that, in Europe, Sony is already very well established, thanks to its other activities. For example, in France, the sales of consoles were mainly in supermarkets and in high-tech product stores, such as Fnac or Virgin Megastores. Stores that Sony knows very well thanks to its other activities and therefore negotiates much more advantageous spots and a reduced price. What Sega and Nintendo cannot do, as they are only selling video game-related products. And the worst thing? The French release of the Nintendo 64 is postponed to September 1997 because of internal problems at Nintendo France. France being the biggest market in all of Europe at the time, it's a huge loss. And when the console comes out, everyone already has a PlayStation with lots of games. It lands much too late to shine, but surprisingly, it will get off to a good start in France, thanks again to Super Mario 64, even if sales will drop quite quickly. But in August 1997, it's the GoldenEye revolution that landed on the console, and it shows a new facet of the controller that allows FPS games to be played on the console without compromise. GoldenEye is a wonderful and very innovative game developed by Rare. It impresses first of all with its game engine, with its realistic graphics, its explosions, its bullet holes that remain after being fired, and all that in detailed and varied environments, from a bunker to a frygate, through a jungle to an Egyptian temple. But what will really amaze everyone is the artificial intelligence of the enemies who are able to take cover when they are shot at, who roll, crouch to avoid bullets, hold the parts of the bodies on which they were shot, fall when we shoot them in the legs. It's crazy for the time. Remember that Half-Life is not even out yet. Furthermore, GoldenEye is the first FPS to integrate infiltration phases to pass in vents or in the back of the enemies to kill them with a silent pistol without making noise, and the AI of the enemies is able to hear the noise generated by weapons and to react to them. It's an exceptional game that will put the Nintendo 64 back on track. And then Mario Kart 64 releases in the rest of the world, and the game is magnificent, and it's a hell of an evolution compared to the Super NES episode. The environments are very diversified, and the console allows for great freedom in the construction of circuits and in their variety with Toad's Turnpike that makes you drive in the middle of cars and trucks. The Choco Mountain will make you drive under an avalanche of stone. The Calamari Desert has a train that will pass repeatedly, forcing you to adapt your speed. Frappy Snowland where you drive in the middle of snowmen. The DK Jungle with coconuts that come to torment you as soon as you leave the road. It's amazing how much work there is on each race. And above all, the console will allow the game to be much easier to handle thanks to the joystick and to play with four players on the same console thanks to the four ports. Mario Kart 64 comes to show a new aspect of the console and that the novelties brought by Nintendo with its console are thought out and will reveal their full potential in games. And now, thanks to 3D rendering in real time, the circuits can now offer vertical ascents and descents and large jumps like the one of the Royal Circuit. Mario Kart 64 is prodigious, 
and its release will be a gigantic tsunami. It will sell at an exceptional speed. It exceeds 1 million in just a few weeks and even beats the previous sales record held by Super Mario 64 at the time. And as unbelievable as it may seem, the Nintendo 64 is catching up with the PlayStation and outselling Sony's console, even with far fewer games. It's wild and unexpected, with everything that's happened, and while everyone thought the PlayStation was too far off to catch up, the Nintendo 64 is coming back at full speed. But the console sales will not take off for long for a good and simple reason. The explosion of piracy on the PlayStation, which will make sales of the Sony's PlayStation skyrocket, whether it's with a Game Shark, with the swap disc method, or with the mod chips installed in the console, it's very easy to burn games onto blank CDs and playing without buying them, and that's going to be a huge tornado. It's the first console in history to have such omnipresent piracy, and Sony can't manage to fight against the phenomenon. It will increase from week to week. The word will spread all over the world and contrast with the price of Nintendo 64 games, which are super expensive. So if you were a player back then, you had the choice between buying a PlayStation with dozens of games every month that you could have for almost nothing, or you could buy the Nintendo 64 with very few games and where each game costs a fortune. Inevitably, many chose the PlayStation, especially since, at the time, people were not really aware of the downsides of piracy and the harm it could cause. It was something extremely popular. There are even stores that installed chips and where you could buy burned CDs for very little. And then in the middle of the year, Nintendo announces the delay of several games. Major League Baseball, a baseball game which was eagerly awaited in the US, and Banjo-Kazooie, the next big title from Rare, both are postponed. And Nintendo also announces that the release of the 64DD is once again postponed, that it will not be released in 1997, and that Zelda 64 will be ported to cartridge. It's a disaster. There's nothing left, no more games in 97 for Nintendo, while Mario Kart 64 and GoldenEye had brought the console back from hell and it was selling really well, these postponements mean that in the end of the year 1997, which was a crucial year in this war, the console is not going to have any big games at Christmas at the most important moment. Just a few more secondary games like Yoshi's Story and Diddy Kong Racing, but inevitably, while the piracy is rampant on the other console, sales of the PlayStation exploded and left the Nintendo 64 on the floor. At the end of the year, the 1997 Shoshinkai is held, and this show is going to be tricky for the console. Zelda 64, now called The Legend of Zelda, Ocarina of Time, will be shown with a few images before being pushed back to the end of the year 1998 this time. In fact, this show makes no sense because Nintendo is again promoting the 64DD, but they announced that games originally planned on the 64DD will be released on cartridges, such as Pokemon Stadium, Pokemon Snap, or Ocarina of Time. Suddenly, everyone is a little lost, and we understand little by little that the 64DD will not come out right away. And that, anyway, the star of the show is Pokemon. We are in the midst of Pokemania in Japan, and a demo of Pokemon Gold and Silver is playable there, and it will attract all the attention. No one cares about the Nintendo 64, even Nintendo, which attaches great importance to the much more profitable Pokemon phenomenon, and which they announce internationally the following year. Nintendo chose to support Pokemon way more than the Nintendo 64 because they couldn't do both and Pokemon was an unexpected hit. But Nintendo promises that the year of 1998 will be the biggest year for the console and above all, promises that the wait for Zelda 64 will be justified by the innovative concepts that it will bring, that it will be a unique experience in the history of video games. They repeat again and again their policy of quality more than quantity, but Sony, for its part, has just released the DualShock, which fixes the stick problems of the previous controller and adds vibration support, which was only available in Japan so far. And with that, Sony is also preparing an avalanche of big games, as Sega announces that it has almost finished designing its next console and that it will arrive the following year. The year 1998 promises to be a legendary year. The year 1998 begins with yet another postponement of the 64DD. So what's going on? Why is it still not ready? Well, actually, the 64DD is ready and finalized and is even ready to go on sale. 
but Nintendo is in a vicious circle. On the one hand, Nintendo needs the console to be installed in people's homes before being able to offer an extension. But on the other hand, many people are waiting for the extension before buying the console. So no extension, less sales, but fewer sales, even less chance of seeing the 64DD come out. And the more time passes, the more games that are planned for the 64DD are converted to cartridges and therefore are delayed. The beginning of the year 1998 sees the explosion of rumors around a potential Super Mario 64 2, which will make everyone believe that the game is finished and that it will be released this year. While Nintendo never really said that, they did explain that they were thinking about it as a sequel, but neither talking about a beta version and even less about a release date. And then as everyone criticizes the console for its lack of fighting games, RPGs, and sports games kind of games that are usually brought by third-party publishers, Nintendo takes matters into its own hands and will do it themselves. They will develop the excellent Snowboarding 1080, which will delight while everyone expected a classic sport game, but Nintendo has made it a wonder, an extremely complete game, easy to learn, but very deep with a complex gameplay and very impressive graphically. They will also announce that other sports games are in preparation and developed by Camelot with Mario characters and will be published by Nintendo. The same goes for fighting games. They announced that a big fighting game is in the works and that Super Mario RPG 2 has been entrusted to Intelligent Systems, a studio renowned for its technical expertise. Nintendo responds very well to the critics and will itself fill the game's genres that are missing on the console. But at the same time, Nintendo announces once again that Zelda 64 is postponed again for several months and that it will arrive at the end of the year 98 worldwide. The Nintendo 64 has great games coming soon, but on the PlayStation, it's not soon, it's right now. The year 98 is an outstanding year for the PlayStation with a lot of exceptional games. The incredible racing simulation Gran Turismo, Tekken 3, which represents the culmination of the 3D fighting game, Crash Bandicoot 3, the excellent Metal Gear Solid, Resident Evil 2, Tomb Raider 3, Parasite Eve. It's just staggering in a few months how many good games is coming to the console, especially when a lot of people enjoy these games through piracy. And on top of that, there is now new games very inspired by Super Mario 64 like Spyro or Medieval, bringing an alternative to Nintendo's masterpiece. Sony's strategy of allying with a lot of the biggest developers is suddenly paying off with all these big games. And it's not just Sony, because 1998 was also a big year for the PC, which was gaining ground at the time, driven by the release of the big Half-Life Revolution, which will completely overshadow the release of Quake on the Nintendo 64, accompanied by some gems like Grim Fandango. But the year 1998 is also the year when Sega does its marketing campaign, and then releases its new console in Japan, the Dreamcast which will get off to a good start leading the way of a new generation of consoles and therefore has much better graphics than the PlayStation and the Nintendo 64 and comes with its new controller which integrates a joystick and a small screen. For the Nintendo 64 it gets even more complicated. With all that it has disappeared and sales slowing down during the year the competition is too fierce to exist with so few new games. It will still have a few bursts with the very good Banjo-Kazooie which takes up the Super Mario 64 formula with a few touches of originality which come to make the console breathe after having been postponed several times and which comes directly to fight against the 3D platformers of the PlayStation, and its reception is wonderful. A few weeks later, the very impressive F-Zero X, the sequel to F-Zero, gives a huge adrenaline rush with races at incredible speed and where you have to react very quickly. According to GameSpot, F-Zero X is the first racing game ever to run at 60 FPS and is playable up to four players. That's a huge technical achievement, but that's not enough to keep the console alive with the ubiquitous and fierce competition. Fortunately, after a difficult year, the end is the birth of a legendary game. 
The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time releases worldwide, and it's an unprecedented tsunami in the history of video games. It sells at an incredible speed, so incredible that it became the most profitable home game in 1998, despite coming out at the end of November. In a single month, it did better than all the big games I've told you about before, and achieving that while the Nintendo 64 sold much less than the PlayStation. It goes into the Guinness Book of World Records as the game that sold the most in the first six weeks, and as the game that reached the million copies the fastest, in less than a week. Records that it will keep for a long time. It's so popular that it will overshadow the Dreamcast release in Japan, and will be permanently out of stock. And all this in the midst of a shortage of semiconductors, which prevented Nintendo from manufacturing and selling as many cartridges as they could have. And it's well deserved by the fact that the game is one of the greatest games of all time. It's going to bring so much to the gaming world and show everyone how to do three-dimensional adventure and battles, with a button that changes its function based on the elements around Link, and its function is even displayed in real time on the screen. With a supernatural aiming button thanks to the Z button on the controller, and lots of new movements that allow Link to have epic 3D fights with rolls, backflips, side jumps, where the vast majority of 3D action games have ridiculous fights because the developers have a hard time managing this third dimension in real time. Ocarina of Time shows everyone how to make an action-adventure game in 3D, and all these novelties will become standards in the industry. And we are still using them today. For example, the base of the Dark Souls fights is directly taken from Ocarina of Time. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. This game has exceptional depth and endless content. There are 12 dungeons, all completely different, dozens of objects to use that are introduced in an easy way before being complexified and used to their full potential, sublimated by an FPS vision for objects that requires precision, and with the addition of a time travel mechanism that allows Link to be played as a child and an adult, both in completely different atmospheres, with the time-changing environments and clever ideas like being able to plant beans in the past so you can ride them in the future. The graphics are just as incredible, with a lot of detail in the textures and a lot of animations for Link, for his face, for the enemies, or even the other characters. Technically, the game is incredible. It shows the incredible capabilities of the machine. The areas to explore are huge and very detailed, and thanks to that, it was able to create striking atmospheres and moods throughout the game. The game starts with an awesome transparent tutorial that teaches the player everything without them even realizing it. From scratch and based on no other game, Nintendo has created a whole new type of adventure with new mechanics that will be copied and reused everywhere. It was so ahead of its time on every level that its structure was used by thousands of other developers in thousands of games. Even today, it is considered one of the most important games of all time and constantly comes up when talking about the best games of all time. It received about 15 awards the year it came out, and it was elected by 17 influential magazines and websites as the best game of all time. Whether it was then or still today, 25 years later, it is still considered one of the best games of all time. Can you imagine the earthquake it was when it was released? It is the first game in history to have a perfect score on the prestigious Japanese magazine Famitsu. It is the same for EGM, which qualifies it as the best game of all time. IGN also gives it the maximum score and talks about it as a new benchmark for all games, and which demonstrates the incredible gap that separates Nintendo from other developers. The same for the Spanish magazine 64, for which Ocarina of Time is the best game of all time. The same goes for Arcade 02 magazine, which even advises people to buy the console for the game. Next Generation's titles that it is the game of the century. It will also have the perfect score for Edge Magazine, which speaks of it as a new standard which shows the power of a video game, the X64 Magazine, which does not even know how to rate it because it's so above the rest, and I could go on and on for hours. Ocarina of Time was a real tornado at its release and made history. And the success of Ocarina of Time is so overwhelming that the Nintendo 64 saves its year, even if it's far away from the PlayStation, and its explosion since the arrival of piracy and the good games after the 64 DD fiasco and all the postponed games, it's a miracle that it sold so much with so few games available. And with the release of Mario Party 1 in Japan, Nintendo will once again do what no other console is capable of. And next to all this, 
the Pokemon phenomenon lands in the United States and will sell at an incredible speed, and blowing up sales of the Game Boy Color at the same time which has just been released. The year 1998 was paradoxical for Nintendo. It was very empty until the end, but the few games released that year and those already released in the years before sold so well that more than half of them are in the top 10 of the most profitable games of the year. But from its side, Sony is preparing its most ambitious project, which will shake up the following year. The beginning of the year 1999 is calm, and then in Japan Final Fantasy VIII is released, and in spite of a good start, the beginnings are weaker than Final Fantasy VII because Ocarina of Time continues to sell really well and keeps attracting the spotlight. And then Nintendo releases an accessory that boosts the memory of the Nintendo 64, the expansion pack that was supposed to come out with the 64DD. In several games, it is optional, and it improves the graphics of the game, especially in terms of textures, and removes some of the fog that some games had. But surprisingly, Nintendo will also announce that it will be mandatory for some games that will be released since it will allow new graphical effects and it will also be included in the Donkey Kong 64 box in a lot of countries for this reason. And then Pokemon comes out in Europe, and it's the same as elsewhere. The Pokemania takes shape and will be there for years, highlighting Nintendo, but also overshadowing the Nintendo 64. And then comes the month of March 99 and the Tokyo Game Show. Ken Kutaragi takes the stage and announces the PlayStation 2 and its monstrous hardware developed in partnership with Toshiba to create a brand new processor called the Emotion Engine, which is extremely impressive. Sony claims it can display up to 30 million polygons per second, when the Nintendo 64 can only display 160,000. Do you realize how crazy this introduction is at the time? Sony announces that they have created the most powerful console in history, more powerful than the PCs of the time. They've invested over $2 billion in semiconductor companies to get there. It's just mind-blowing. But even crazier, Sony announces that its console will be backwards compatible with PlayStation 1 games. So, even though they announce a new console, people still buy all the games that have just been released. But even crazier, Sony announces that it will also act as a CD and DVD player. We are at the end of the 90s. DVD players are now very new. It was insane as an announcement, especially since Sony is already giving the year 2000 as the release date. And then the 64DD comes out at the end of 99 in the most total indifference, with a few very rare games including Mario Artist and an extension for F-Zero X, as well as an online service. It will be a total failure, and it will not be released outside of Japan, and that's normal. It's no use anymore in the meantime. Cartridges have evolved and can now contain as much data as magnetic disks. But the worst part? The 64DD is not even sold in stores, only via a mail service to which you have to subscribe, and no one has done it, especially since the extension was not really advertised. And in turn, Microsoft announces that they are going to enter the video game market and that they are working on a new console, that it will be more powerful than the PlayStation 2, that they are going to buy studios to provide it with lots of exclusive games, and that it will be available next year. Microsoft entering the dance is very surprising, and inevitably it attracts a lot of attention from players and journalists. And suddenly Nintendo is forced to announce that they are working on a new console, whose codename is Project Dolphin, and Nintendo announces that it will be even more powerful than all the other consoles. But they announce that when they haven't even really advanced on the design of the console. They don't even know if it will use CD support yet. And above all, it is announced less than three years after the release of the Nintendo 64 in Japan. Less than two years for the international release, and even worse for France, where it is barely one and a half years later. Can you imagine? It's less than the time that has passed since the release of the PlayStation 5 to today. And from there, the world of video games gets carried away, and Sony begins its huge promotional campaign for the release of the PlayStation 2. Month after month, the advertisements follow, one after another, and get all the attention, especially as they announce the big price drop at the same time for the PlayStation 1, which will make sales explode with good games also coming out like Gran Turismo 2, Medal of Honor, Resident Evil 3, Ape Escape, etc. And to fight against all this marketing campaign and the release of the PlayStation 2, Nintendo will release a lot of games for a year and a half, 
Donkey Kong 64, which takes the Super Mario 64 formula, but bigger. More original, with different characters who have different abilities. With finer graphics thanks to the expansion pack. Full of mini-games, a lot of exploration, and with the addition of a multiplayer mode. And then Super Smash Bros. comes along and creates a whole new genre of platform fighting games, where the life bars are replaced by damage percentages, and the higher the percentages, the farther the characters are thrown, and when they go off the screen, they lose a life. The game features Nintendo's mascots, but more than that, just fan service. Each character plays differently, and between the new concepts of percentages, ephemeral combo, platforming, and these characters, Super Smash Bros. is an excellent game, and above all, a unique fighting game, which can't be found anywhere else, only on the Nintendo 64 and sublimated once again by the four ports of the machine, which means that four people can play at the same time. And great games follow one after another with Mario parties, great board games with mini games at the end of each turn, awesome games to play with friends, thanks to once again to the four ports of the console. And then Mario Golf and Mario Tennis come out, and they are also super fun sports games, easy to play and harder to master. And then to support Pokemania, the console will see the release of a lot of Pokemon games. Pokemon Puzzle League, Hey Pikachu with a microphone accessory that allows the player to talk to Pikachu, but which will never be released in Europe. Pokemon Snap, a rail shooter, where you need to take pictures of Pokemon in their environment, but most importantly, the excellent Pokemon Stadium, which brings Pokemon battles to life in three dimensions with 3D models and magnificent attack animations enhanced by a superb staging. By lots of different environments, super polished and with a commentator during the fights. And on top of that, the game comes with a transfer pack, an accessory that allows you to transfer your Pokemon from the Game Boy versions to Pokemon Stadium and thus bring them to life. All this embellished by lots of different kinds of fights, like the Gym Leader Castle, where you can fight all the Gym Leaders, the other cups like the Challenge Cup, which forces us to use randomly selected Pokemon, the Mini Cup with only non-evolved Level 5 Pokemon, the Prime Cup, where all Pokemon are Level 100, the Pokemon Academy, where we are taught Pokemon battles and even mini-games in the world of Pokemon. It's a ultra-complete game we can even face our rival and unlock a second round where all the trainers are much stronger. And all this with the 251 Pokemon modeled in 3D and all the animated attacks, Pokemon Stadium games are excellent extensions of the Pokemon universe that will convince many players of the depth of Pokemon battles. And then in April 2000, a long-awaited new Zelda game comes out, The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. Developed in just over a year, it's an extremely brave game from Nintendo that doesn't use the Ocarina of Time formula at all. It's set in a new world, Termina. With a much darker and melancholic tone, the ubiquitous theme of death, which brings surprising environments like the Stone Tower or the Kingdom of Icana, with incredible dungeons of the fortress, which can turn upside down, which shows the rooms were designed to be playable normally and upside down. But the greatest strength of the game is the masks that we can put on and which will give a whole host of special powers, make us run faster, create explosions, blend into the background, pretend to be someone else, they bring very interesting and unprecedented game situations. And several of them outright allow Link to transform into a new species, like a Mojo that can spit bubbles, a Goron that can carry heavy things or roll, or a Zora that can swim very quickly and stay underwater. But the big originality of the Zelda game comes from the fact that Link only has 72 hours in the game to make progress in the adventure before the moon crashes on the world and destroys it. So we have to play a melody to go back three days each time, which means that all the big advancements that we have to make, such as dungeons or visiting new places, must be done in less than 72 hours in the game, which creates a feeling of unease, oppression, and permanent tension. Majora's Mask is an excellent game, and once again, a game that creates feelings that we are not used to when playing a game, and it's quite bold of Nintendo to dare, after Ocarina of Time, to make such a different Zelda with such different atmospheres. And then, right, it's Perfect Dark, which releases on the console, a new FPS made by Rare, which renews the GoldenEye formula with more open levels and freer objectives, much better graphics, an original story, with the possibility of disarming enemies rather than killing them, better localization of damage, more exploration rather than having wave of enemies to kill, 
an adventure that can be done in co-op, lots of new weapons that can be used, and lots of different situations. For all these reasons, Perfect Dark is a monument of the FPS genre, and once again made possible thanks to this controller, just as suitable for this type of game on console. And then just a few weeks later, Paper Mario releases on the console, and Paper Mario is Nintendo's proof to everyone that the console is good enough for RPGs, on cartridges, and without any compromise, since it has nothing to be jealous of PlayStation RPGs. With its unique artistic direction, and especially the way the game constantly renewed itself and surprises the player, it's a great game that will give birth to a whole new series. And with the release of sequels to popular series like Kirby 64, Banjo-Tooie, or Excitebike 64, the year 2000 is insane for the console, which has great games coming out every month. Even if all these games sold quite well, they will be eclipsed, just like the console by the marketing and the release of the PlayStation 2, which will be a real phenomenon, breaking all records with the shortage organized by Sony. The PlayStation 2 is destroying the competition, even if the launch games are really not good. Even if the first consoles have design flaws, the PlayStation 2 walks on everything else and comes to sound the death knell of the new console generation, which the Dreamcast failed to do. The Nintendo 64 is a fabulous console, a console that has been able to breathe new life into the whole video game industry, which has had a lot of trouble understanding this third dimension whether at the level of its design, at the level of the console in itself, with the four controller ports, whether at the level of its excellent controller, which brought the analog stick, the vibrations, the control buttons of the camera, or at the level of the games, which revolutionized the entire gaming world. The Nintendo 64 is the most revolutionary console of all time, as all the new features introduced by the console were quickly copied and became industry standards. But the question we can ask is the Nintendo 64 a failure? If we look at the sales of the console and compare them to that of the PlayStation, we can think that the Nintendo 64 is a flop. But obviously, it's not that simple. Sony invested a lot more money than Nintendo to support its PlayStation, and above all has invested a lot of money to deprive its competitors of third-party publishers, who have all gone to the PlayStation. Nintendo, which has always benefited from their support before, found itself alone in having to defend and sell its console, and in this context, what Nintendo has done is extremely impressive, especially after all that has happened, all these postponements for the console, three years between its announcement and its release, its release a year and a half after everyone else, and its very limited life cycle, barely four years is very short for a console, especially since the PlayStation has enjoyed a huge boost in sales due to ubiquitous piracy on the console. And Sony didn't just use money to use money, they used their money really intelligently. They did a wonderful job at marketing the console, and their strategy paid off. Ken Kutaragi, who carried out the project, mentioned multiple times Nintendo games, and he was smart enough to realize that Sony doesn't have the knowledge and competencies to make games that can compete with Nintendo's ones, and therefore put forward the kinds of games that Nintendo didn't make and focused on a policy of quantity rather than quality. But it's crazy that Nintendo managed to survive in this context. Just look at Sega. The Saturn was a monumental failure, partly because it was abandoned by third-party publishers. Nintendo managed to survive on its own thanks to the unequaled quality of its games and thanks to strong choices. Many believe that the choice of the cartridge format is what killed the console when, in the end, it is probably what allowed it to survive and to create games that only the Nintendo 64 was capable of supporting with cartridges that evolve enormously during its life cycle, allowing better support for the console, and also emphasizing the multiplayer side that the other consoles could not afford. And then even from a commercial point of view, Nintendo does not make money by selling consoles. Nintendo makes money by selling games, and precisely, the paradox of the Nintendo 64 is that even if it didn't sell that well, the game sold extremely well. Almost half of the games in the top 10 best-selling home games of this generation are Nintendo 64 games. And the best-selling game is Super Mario 64, which is an aberration considering the difference in sales between the PlayStation and the Nintendo 64. And besides, that's what Miyamoto said in an interview in a French magazine in 1998. Nintendo never made so much money as in this period. There and that was before Pokemon came out and across the world as well. And that's also why the policy of quality rather than quantity is more interesting for Nintendo in this context, 
when, let's be frank, Nintendo cannot fight with Sony and its huge investments. It is therefore a bit absurd to speak of the Nintendo 64 as a failure, especially given the predominant role it had in the history of video games. It is also the console that saw the birth of a huge series, Mario in 3D, Zelda in 3D, Mario Tennis, Paper Mario, Mario Golf, Super Smash Bros., Mario Party, etc. And above all, Super Mario 64 and Ocarina of Time are considered by many to be the most important games of all time for their impact on the world of video games, and they could not have seen the light of day on a different console. Thank you so much for watching the video until the end. Don't forget to like the video, please. I plan to make a documentary on all consoles and much more. I have lots of other great videos in preparation, and I hope you will like them. If you don't want to miss them, don't hesitate to subscribe. See you soon for a new video. Bye.